Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today, we're doing a book club episode with Clive Bauscher. He wrote a book within the uh, within the NSBT series, which is the New Studies in Biblical Theology series, published by InterVarsity Press, IVB Press, and the series editor is D.A. Carson. So we're going to be having a conversation with Clive Bauscher, and the title of his book within the series is Life in the Sun, Exploring Participation and Union with Christ in John's Gospel and Letters. Uh, there is an endorsement for his book from one of our previous guests I would like to read. Um, it was from Stephen Wellam, and he wrote this about uh, Clive's book. Given that union with Christ is central to how Christ's work becomes ours, and given the diverse interpretations of it in theology, we need to return anew to Scripture to grasp properly this glorious truth. In gr this groundbreaking work, Clive Bauscher does precisely this. He offers careful biblical and the theological reasoning that clarifies what union with Christ is, and as such, we are indebted to him. This work is essential reading for understanding and glorying in what it means to be united with, to Christ and thus to be in covenant relationship with our triune creator, redeemer, and Lord. And so if you guys go to our show notes, there is a link to IVB, IVB. P press and uh, it'll take you right to uh, the NSBT series to this book. So you can get that for yourself. Um, there's also just uh, other links and resources for you guys, how to communicate with us, how to find us. Um, these conversations are also on YouTube, so you can find us there. And then also if you need to find a church to call home and you, you're not part of a church yet, there's a local church finder to find a reformed or confessional church near your area. So I'll let Peter further introduce Clive Bauscher today. Absolutely. We have Dr. Clive Bauscher, who is provost, I think newly appointed or relatively newly appointed provost of Union School of Theology, where he teaches and researches New Testament and biblical theology, which makes sense for this book. Previously, he served as lead minister of a local church and co-mentored Union's learning community in Oxford, United Kingdom. He has held positions at the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and Bristol. It is a pleasure having you on the show, Dr. Bauscher. Thank you both. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Peter. It's uh, it's brilliant to be with you. Of Thanks course, yeah. This, this will be fun. Yeah, looking forward to it. So, for our for our audience, kind of a kind of a preliminary get to know you question for those who see this name is like, okay, let's let's get to know this guy a little bit. So. Let our listeners know maybe a little bit more in depth about yourself, your background, and your work. Okay. Um, I'm married to Shashton. We've been married just over 25 years. Uh, the decades go quicker that's, than you think they might. That's right. Uh, we've got we've got one son, Alistair, um, who's 12. He's our only child. Um, bit about my background. I used to be a mathematical scientist. Huh. Um, before I was called into ministry um, and then sort of started again and went uh, went to seminary and yeah, was a, a, a local church pastor for a while and mm -hmm. then called to serve at a uh, Union School of Theology, as you said, as, as provost. We say provost here in the UK. I think I prefer provost. That's got a better provost. Okay. <laughs> um, and Different I've syllables. Been, I've been... I've been at Union for about 18 months. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Curious, because you, you just brought it up before next question. What what kind of math did you do? What kind of math did you uh, research? So the, the, the math was sort of probabilistic. So it was statistical and dynamic and, uh, yeah, to do with networks and that sort of stuff. So um, did some research in financial markets and some in mathematical oh. biology using similar kinds of mathematics that feels like a long time ago now <laughs> yeah. have you I'm, I'm assuming you have not touched it since you left it and went into the ministry that's true 
<laughs> yeah. gosh, okay. And pro probably if you ask me to kind of explain it now, that would take me a little while to get my <laughs> head in that space, I think. But yeah. Gotcha. It's cool to yeah, see. I was I was in the fitness industry before going into ministry. So it's cool to see okay. other people who had kind of quote unquote real people jobs before ministry work. Yeah. 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 And I think I'm glad I did that actually, that I worked yeah. in a different setting. I think yeah, same here. Totally. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's all it's always uh, interesting to learn too how even if it seems very separate from like theology how you can use your old jobs uh like fitness or or math uh yeah. and help you with your theological learning have you ever yeah. had those uh times did it cross over at all ever i mean not like oh how i did a math problem is how i do theology but like maybe some of the some of the way you learned or anything like that Not really <laughs> i'll tell you what it doesn't transfer too well for preaching because you want it to be very narratival right? <laughs> that's you true illustrations you want yeah. some poetic language so, so maybe you touch you what not feel to do like i'm preaching. drawing on my math brain when i yeah. preach yeah yeah, not, yeah. Not much. but with theology how does it help i think the precision can help mm -hmm. you know <clears throat> just just to pay really close attention to stuff and make sure the, the logic really hangs together. Mm, that's good. I like it. Yeah. And following through until you get an answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. 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 But it could also be the opposite where like you were, um, you may have been, yeah, so academically or kind of logically inclined to where you forget about the overarching arc of the, like a narrative of scripture. So you kind of have to not relegate that, but it's okay. This is how I approach math and I have to approach this maybe in a, in a larger sense than what I did before, which kind of it's not directly comparable but within fitness i had to learn really quickly how to be um personable with individual people and groups which which helped me in theology um but other stuff was was not as helpful for theology or pastoral <laughs> ministry because you could talk to clients in a way that you cannot talk to members of your church i, I bet you had an easier time reading the measurements of how to build Noah's Ark though too. Oh, this <laughs> and it came all to those measurements and it starts getting true. lost in my brain and you're like, yep, yeah. I'm right on par. I I understand what those cubit measurements are and all those things. Um so yeah, let's go right into my first question about the book. Um life life in the sun here. So uh as you describe in the introduction of your book, while there's been many treatments of the union with Christ in the Pauline letters, understandably, or in the Bible more generally, there hasn't been a lot of uh, the same look in the Gospel of John and his Johannian letters. What brought you to this topic and writing this book? Yeah, so that's true, I think. Probably most of what you might have read about Union with Christ is focusing on Pauline material. Yeah. Um, oddly, I, I I kind of came at it that way because I was reading a book by uh, by Gaffin called um, I think it's called Resurrection and Redemption yep. or something like that. One of his big yeah famous title? works. Yeah. And um, I love that book. I I found that a real eye opener, and I thought, oh, I wonder how similar ideas might be going on in in John's writing. And that was that was kind of how I came to start to look at participation with Christ in John's writings. And then as I read through the Gospel of John, I kept coming across this in one another language, you know, where Jesus says uh, in that day, you'll know that I, Jesus, am in the Father and that I'm in you and you're in yep. me. Yep. And I thought, yep. well, you know, that is really striking language. I mean, I'd read it before, but I was really focusing in on it and as i started to do a little bit of bibliographical research it occurred to me that not many people had actually researched this intensively not many people had tried to get to grips with what this language really means hmm. i mean you can hear that and go oh yeah okay that sounds profound sure. sounds special which it is but you know what what does it actually mean and so I, I focused in on that as the sort of point of departure for this work hmm. when I started. Okay. Yeah, and I think going into my question, this bridge as well. <clears throat> um, 
it's it can be what maybe easier in a sense to anchor these doctrines oneness part- participation with with the son in the epistles and especially so in paul because they like they're so you can i mean you guys like doctrinally or didactically focused like they're they're clear i guess you can say on this uh but how am i focusing on what you just said like gospel narratives where it's not propounding hey this is what we believe this is what we believe this is what you should believe but it's within the narrative of something surrounding jesus ground our participation in union in the saints what what passages because you focus on a few chapters a few passages uh more particularly so and how might they help us kind of within this narratival scheme of of the gospels help us read our union with christ as a whole throughout okay wow that was a long question that was like a paragraph (laughs) (laughs) yeah you you give me a lot to to remember there okay let's unpack that a little bit i think I think what you said about about the epistles, and I guess you think about the Pauline epistles in yeah. particular, that that's kind of partly true in that it the the language of union with Christ, the language of being in Christ or dying with Christ and being raised with Christ, kind of leaps out at you. Sure, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's all over the place. But but even there, you know, there are questions about what what does it really mean. Okay. Um. I guess in John, maybe it doesn't leap out quite as much. But if you if if you look at particular parts of John's gospel, yeah, actually, there's a lot of that kind of language. So yeah. like John six and the bread mm-hmm. of life mm-hmm. discourses, there's a lot of it there. Um, there's a lot in the farewell discourse as well. Yeah. Um, chapters 13 through through 17. Yep. Yep. So to begin with, at least. The, the book focuses on those sections in particular. Um, but then when you go to, to f- you call it First John, don't you, in North America? <laughs> we do, yeah. They mm. call it One John over here, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's more literal, what yeah. it says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you go to First John, and, I mean, maybe it doesn't quite leap off the page quite mm. so much. You have to get a little bit further through the letter, mm. but but towards the well just after the middle of the letter i suppose and and kind of in what i would think of as the climax you get that mutual abiding mm-hmm. god 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 remaining in the individual and the individual in god yep. you know sort of rapid fire several times and I, I think actually that that that's one of john's main things that he's trying to get across in in, in first john as well so yeah, this this uh, this in one another relationship, this 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 mutual remaining, I think is 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 central to to Johannine theology. Yeah. And before before Nick goes, and maybe for our audience too, and for for me as well, um, is there a difference between kind of you can like mutual indwelling or oneness with Christ and union with Christ? Because I think sometimes in our, in our brains we can think, okay, union, I'm with him, but like maybe he's less than me. But then he and me and I and him, just as he's in the father and the father. Is, is there is there a difference in that? Okay. okay, so union with Christ, I guess, is a, a systematic theology term, isn't it? And and so first of all, I ask, well, what is union with Christ in the Johannine writings? What yeah. is union with Christ in the fourth gospel? What is it in first John? And I wanted to use a, a language and a sort of concept that is actually there in in john's writing yeah and and that concept is oneness so you know J- jesus says um at least a couple of times in in john's gospel i and the father are one mm-hmm. yeah and and so it sort of occurred to me that the the right concept for thinking about union in John's writings is oneness. Gotcha. Um, it, it, because not only does does oneness describe the relationship of the Father and the Son in the Trinity, mm-hmm. it it's the same kind of language that Jesus is using to describe our relationship with him. Yeah. So oneness of the Father and the Son, Jesus not only says, I and the Father are one, he also says, um, I, the son, am in the father and the father is in me. 
Yep. That, that's kind of like what oneness means mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. gospel. It's, that, it, it's equivalent to that in one another relationship. But then he sort of blows you away by saying, actually, it, you enjoy the same kind of in one another relationship with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's that relational oneness that is union with Christ. And, and union sounds like that, right? You know, it's a it, it's a making one. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, in what sense one? Mm. And it is relationally. It's a, a, a oneness of fellowship, you might say, of, of, of communion, that sort of thing. Got it. That's helpful. That's amazing that we're even invited yeah. to that relationship. We enjoy that same relationship with right. the with the son as the son has with the father. Yeah, and if and then yeah. therefore we have the relationship, relationship with the father as the son has with the father. But mind blowing because there's no way we deserve that. <laughs> as fallen, or creatures... I think sometimes like Christians think, um, yeah, we have a relationship with with Jesus, but it's not really the same, or it's derived from what He has with the Father. We're like we don't enjoy everything that He has, and I think maybe they don't say that, but maybe practically speaking, some of their doctrinal formulation comes out with that where. Um, that's a special relationship that we really have no access to. We're just kind of grafted in on the side with right. with Christ versus no, we have precisely the same relationship as the son has with the father. We have with the father and the son. But important to know too, that we'll never be God. We'll yeah. never be. Right. Right. So yeah. Yeah. yeah right. So I think I'd say we're, we're invited relationally in to share the life of the trinity hmm. yeah and, and union yeah, there's also there is something different about the son's relationship with the father and and, and mm. that is that they 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 share the identity of yeah of the god of israel right yeah. they, they share the identity of yahweh yeah so yeah. so we're, we're we're not becoming divine we're not no. becoming god but i know that's not what you meant no. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But, but yeah, we 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 we're loved in the same way that the father loves the son. That's a better way of putting it. That's great. That's and awesome. That, yeah. that, that is amazing because yeah. I mean, there's no question of accept of, of a lack of acceptance. You know, there's there's no question of a lack of permanence. Yeah, um, or degrees of love, right. um, dissimilar, where there is a perfect degree of love, but maybe a lesser perfect degree of love between us right. and the sun. Well, and something as like a old pastor I had is we get Jesus's resume. It's not our resume we're giving because it's not our merits. It's, it's, it's grace. So when God, the father looks at us through the gospel, through the covenant of grace, he's seeing Christ as son's record because we um, are, you know, he fulfilled the law for us essentially. And, you know, the, the word union is derivative of united. So right. yeah, you were united to that fellowship with God. And, um, you know, we like defining terms on our show too. And usually it's like one of the first question or two, we kind of left it to this point because, uh, we want to create some extra groundwork going into defining terms so there's both terms of oneness and union. And I know you just kind of answered part of it. So apologize. There's a little bit of repetitiveness. To so uh, there's terms oneness slash union and participation. Um, so bears asking, how does the Bible define or utilize both terms in relation to us and the triune Godhead through the son, Jesus? How, how does scripture define union? How does it, Define. Yeah, and then you have a you have a longer mm -hmm. definition, I think, of oneness or participation. If you want to share that as yeah. well with the audience, yes. Yeah, so, so it, it it defines it in John at least union, um, in 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 terms of oneness, mm -hmm. and 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 it's a a relational oneness. Part participation. Um, that that word, uh, if you want to translate that into into Koine Greek, does does appear in one John. So that that's Koinonia, and that's a, a kind of participation. Yeah. What what what's most interesting about 
point in here in in one john is that he is clearly a relational participation hmm. and um it, it, it is to do with knowing god that that's really clear from the first couple of chapters in the letter but then he, he sort of the writer um goes deeper and says well well w- what kind of relational participation is it and and the answer he gives is well it, it's in one another relationship it's it's in one another participation if you like it, it it's god in you and and you in god so so in that sense um the the johannine literature does give a give a sort of definition of participation hmm. although in, in in new testament studies participation is kind of a, a broader thing and there's lots we could say there but yeah yeah because i was i think just really really simply if you hear participation you want to be thinking sharing mm-hmm. yeah okay. a, a participation is a sharing yeah 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 i think and, yeah keep going sorry no no and, and um one of the things that really comes out of the book is that it's this it's this relational sharing with christ that is that is right at the heart of the gospel and yeah. so, so going back um nick to something you said just just a little bit ago it, it it's not only that our union with christ um has sort of forensic implications right that that we are now fully right with god it's it, it's also that that god the father delights in this this kind of fellowship and relationship with us indeed that's what he saved us for mm-hmm. you know he, he saved us out of condemnation but just astonishingly into this kind of love this kind of fellowship this kind of relationship and that's yeah I, that's just beautiful i think yeah mm-hmm. that's that's uh that's uh it's a way of understanding this that i think is a little lost in some of the circles at least in American evangelicalism, where very often I hear, maybe you've heard this before, like, oh, Christ died for your sins. And it just, it's it's stuck there. There's no, now you have a relationship with the Father, now you have perfect righteousness, where it's so often, hey, Christ died for my sins, and now I'm good. And now I'm like, but if you think about it, like you just said, if your sins are forgiven, that's great. Like you're neutral now, but there's no, there's no delight. It's almost like, okay, God got you to that point, And now like, what are you going to do with it? Mm-hmm. It's... It's he is it's like maybe it's maybe it was a kind of grudging sort of forgiveness. Exactly, and, yeah. And and he doesn't really want me that close. Yeah. Well, yeah. what he actually wants is he did just he, enough to get me to this point, but not a, not more than that. Right. But what what he actually yeah. wants is 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 this sort of relational oneness with me, mm-hmm. where Jesus says, you know, in that day following my resurrection. So this is John fourteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll know mm-hmm. that. I'm in my father, but you'll also know that I mean, I'm in you and you're in me. And yeah. there's this, there's this, this kind of oneness with him. So, you know, if I get up on a Monday morning and I'm not looking forward to the week, yeah. you know, sometimes I will literally do this. I will remind myself, you know, Christ is pleased. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Christ is pleased to, to kind of have brought me into this oneness with him. And, I, and I'm there, I'm I'm in the vine, and it's not a mistake. And I belong there because he said so, as a branch does in a tree. You know, hence, hence the uh, hence the cover on the book. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. That's yeah, true. totally. Yeah. That's and it's uh, yeah, I love how you yeah. build off of these. It's not just he doesn't just start with oneness in John 14, he builds off of it in John 5 with kind of the, the Sabbath and uh, God work on the Sabbath. So the sun works on the Sabbath. John 6, he moves on in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So it's not just he says it once without background. He he kind of builds into this. And it's yeah. it's broader than I think a lot of Christians and like what you talk about your book. It's broader than just your oneness with God kind of out of context. It's It brings all this relational benefit with it outside mm-hmm. of just I'm with God. Because I think, again, some Christians are like, well, that's kind of boring. Um, heaven just being with God, Christians think it's boring. But yeah, there's there's bigger broader implications and benefits of this it's not just okay theoretically i'm one with god but no that that means i have the benefits of being one with god along with that mm-hmm. um well, and uh, like, so, i get i get it. to know him right i get yeah. i get to know him 
and and I get to be known, which I think I think is pretty pretty big stuff. You know, I yeah. God knows me fully, and He loves me this way. You know, He He loves me as He loves the Son. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas yeah. you know, I might think knowing me fully would be likely to put Him off. <laughs> exactly. If if He knew me fully, then He would not want me fully. But that mm -hmm. is not what He yeah, says. And real quick too, I think something peter said earlier this it's so true like with uh american evangelicalism basic sunday school stuff where it's very true jesus died on the cross died for your sins absolutely but it doesn't just stop there it's don't don't stop just at the cross it's about you know his resurrection uh getting us into the right relationship with him through justification the right relationship with god our creator because of his resurrection and who God is and, and his Jesus ascension is. and seating at the right hand of God. Yes. There's so much more that we forget that, that um, substantiates and shows us the fullness of this oneness. Yes. Yes. The so, beginning. It didn't just, he didn't just, the end of the story isn't just, he died on the cross for his sins and then your record's good. It's like, there needs to be, we are also brought into heaven based on his resurrection and you like guilt, grace, gratitude, our podcast name, summing up the Heidelberg Catechism, it doesn't just stop at grace. It doesn't go guilt, grace. There is the gratitude part too. Yeah. Yep. And there's the, the life part, right? You know, I've come that they may have life. Yeah. Life and, in this sign. Yep. And have it mm -hmm. and have it abundantly. So I sometimes talk about, you know, the, the salvation from, there's what yep. you've been saved out of, there's what you've been saved from. Yep. Mm -hmm. But there's also salvation for. Yeah, exactly. Yep. What 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 has God saved you for? Well, he 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 saved you for life. Um, and 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 this is what it this is what it looks like. You know, this is the essence of the life of the age to come. Um, that you know me in this way, that you 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 share this oneness with me, this 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 closeness, this this intimacy of of love. You know, this sort of song of songs love. Yeah, Amen. totally. Yeah. Um, and, and I do want to bring it out because you, you talk about, you have actually a, a pretty lengthy part of your book that talks about this. And if, if people know this part of one John, as you guys say, um, across the pond right. or first John, as we say in the right way. Um, I actually but... prefer first John, I, th I think. <laughs> it, it sounds better. Awesome. So yeah, that's, uh, we, we Americans like being right all the time. Um, <laughs> there's there's a there's a thorny section in the epistles oh, of john uh right. so when a reader is confronted by the perfection passage in first john three i think they'll look at union okay so union means i gotta i gotta keep working like i gotta i gotta keep going at this perfection stuff i gotta i gotta kind of take away all this stuff if i ever have a, a sinful desire my union with christ is now broken because this passage tells me that if I sin, that I'm I'm no longer in union with Christ, or maybe they kind of derive from it. Um, so you deal with this in relation to our union with Christ. So can you help guide our listeners through this who are struggling? Okay, I, like I get I'm in union, I have life from and towards and in the Son, and yet I still have these sinful desires. And it sure seems like this passage says you cannot have those desires. Okay, so so maybe a verse like First John. See, I'm learning. First John three three <laughs> verse six exactly yep uh, this is the ESV no one who abides in him remains in him actually I mean they've translated here keeps on sinning yeah. but I mean mm -hmm. a, a more straightforward translation would be just sins exactly no, yep. no one who remains in sin or whatever it sin. is yeah uh, no one who sins has either seen him or known him um. Yeah, that's pretty challenging. Yeah, so what do we do if we're like, yeah, we got union, but man, I keep sinning. Right. And Good yet, question. you know, earlier on, um, John says, doesn't he, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not <laughs> right. in us. So it kind of seems yeah. like he's contradicting himself at like a I've, surface level. I've had meeting. this exact same, after reading that, I've had this exact same question to my pastor as well. Yeah. Just to kind right. of clarify. It. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let, let's kind of uh, untangle this a little bit. Yeah, please do. Yeah. <laughs> um, first comment, I think First John as a letter is a lot more 
um, aimed at exhorting his readers than we often think. Hmm. So as you as you read all the way through, um, if you kind of read attentively, sorry, attentively, um, you can see that he is trying to exhort them to um, to love one another more, to um, that kind of life shared life as a fellowship which is only possible as the children of god and i think that goes unnoticed it is the first comment hmm. yeah um why very black and white verses um like uh chapter three verse six there that's the question isn't it yeah john is not saying that um, those who are united with Christ will be perfect in this world. He's categorically not saying that. Yeah. And and we know that from the opening chapter. Yeah. Exactly. Otherwise, yep. he's being inconsistent. And, and this is scripture. So that can't be what is going on here. Yep. So what is going on? Question mark. And I think what is going on is that he is describing something that is a sort of um, black gray contrast, yeah, as a black and white contrast. So, you know, um, you and me, um, if we're trusting Jesus for ourselves and we're in this kind of relationship of love with him, we're, we're in, you know, different areas of our lives somewhere on that gray spectrum. Mm -hmm. We're not completely like him, but really importantly, we we are not like people who have not been born again from above either. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we are we are not in the black, yeah. And right. you, you can sort of see that 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 is the kind of logic he has here, because in chapter three, verse ten, he says, "By this it's evident who are the children of God." Yeah. In other words, in the here and now, there is something that you can actually see about those who have been born again you can see who are the children of god and who are the children of the devil um not not maybe just by sampling you know on some particular day and looking from afar but but if you know someone's life um whoever does not practice righteousness is not of god nor is the one who does not love his brother but again he's not talking about a in reality, a black-white contrast. He's talking about something that is black-gray. So then the question is, um, why does he talk in black and white terms? Yeah. And and I think I think it's a little bit like this. He's he's saying um in a sort of exhorting way, this is the way things are in the family of God. You mm -hmm. know, th this is this is what does characterize us perfectly. No. But but this is what should characterize us and, and partially does. So go be more like that. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is this is what you have in Christ, although you may not display it at all times, is what you have so that you you can right. display this. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Oh, okay. I like that. Okay. Well, I like so that. is it how uh, so it's really well, there the, for the, the grammar sorry, um Nick, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I'm, I apologize. Uh, I was just going to try to follow up and, and I'm digesting yeah. that. And I'm thinking, is that really there more for our assurance, knowing that he's explaining that God the Father knows that we sin, obviously, as bef because we're still. Uh, and he says at the heaven. end of the epistle, those who say they have no sin have not been born yeah. of God. So, but, but because we're in Christ as saved people. He sees us as in Christ, not as in Adam. So he's not seeing us um, uh, based on uh, your merit and, and you're trying to fulfill the law yourself. He's seeing us based on Christ's record because we're in Christ. So we get what Christ, we inherit what Christ has done. Is that correct? Yeah, I think there's, the, there's definitely an identity thing here going yeah. on. Yeah. You know, are well, you're 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 in Christ and Christ is in you. Um and that means you are different already, crucially. 
and you, and you can live differently. And actually, you know that, don't you? Because like when you look back, can you not see how how God has changed you? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Are, are, oh, yeah. are you fully there yet? No. No. But like in reminding you of this, doesn't that make you want to be more like him? Mm -hmm. Because everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself, he says somewhere mm -hmm. in chapter three, I think, and, and will be like him when he appears. Again, he says that somewhere mm -hmm. in chapter three. Sorry, forgive the lack of verse. <laughs> no, it's um, yeah, this is a, it's, a, it's a huge let's, issue. And in, in, in let's John, find yeah. that. Um, Yeah, maybe. Yeah, what while you while you look for yeah for for our listeners, okay. Because um, I I think they they have um. Both both Nick and I have thought about this, and I'm sure this is something that a lot of Christians think. Where yeah, if I'm in union and 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 are these passages, and I think you talk about this in your book. Are these passages like, maybe can you categorize them as these are warning passages, or are they, um, what would you yeah, say no, like are. Are they more like okay? This is this is this is for lack of a better term. These are more assurance passages or more warning passages. Right. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think they're warning passages so much as yes, assuring and exhorting at the same time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he's not he's not like trying to make you question your um, no son status. I, no, I don't think these are tests. Okay. As such. I think that's how a lot of Christians view this is maybe yeah. a little bit on the testing side. Yeah. And you hear it preached that way sometimes, don't you? But I, I think that sort of goes against what we can see the author's trying to achieve overall. Okay. Um, those verses that I was just reading were chapter three or quoting chapter three, um verses two and three beloved we are god's children now mm -hmm. you see that's assuring isn't it mm -hmm. beloved we are god's children now already. before he even gets to the quote-unquote warning passage if you want to yeah. call it that he he grounds you in in god's status in yeah god's that's just like three four verses earlier isn't it from uh, away from three six uh what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that's yeah. a, a good that when he appears we will be like him uh, because we'll see him as he mm. is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, mm. which implies you're not yet fully pure. Totally. Yep. As mm. he is pure. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. We're not. Yeah. So not right not here. warning, um, but assuring yeah. and exhorting. And so he says in um, chapter five. Oh, can I find this? Yeah, while you find it, yeah. So it's for our listeners to summarize. Sorry, um, chapter 5, verse 13. I managed to get it. the book at this time. I write these things to you who believe in the name of, of the Son of God, that you may know that you have life. Yeah. And you can't yeah. you can't get much more assured than that. No, yeah. And that's that's really helpful to to ground this in yeah, that, that our 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 knowledge, not just knowledge, kind of theoretical, but our, our knowing that we are in the sun. So when you look at these passages, he's not testing whether or not you're in the sun. It's this is an exhortation for those who are in the sun. That's right. And and sort of exhortation grounded in what it means to be a child of God. Gotcha. What it okay. means to be in Christ. Yeah, you that's know, helpful. This, yeah. This, this, yeah. This is what he's like. Therefore, you know, you already see this in yourself to some extent. So be like it more because that day is coming. Yeah, it's maybe a little like kind of the new man, old man in Romans 6, where mm -hmm. Paul is saying you like put off the old man, take on the new man. And he's talking to, from what we know, Christians. So he's not saying, okay, you Christians, like, take off the old man as if that's like kind of your job. And now this is, you have this test now to know if you have more old man in you or new man in you. It's like, no, you have, you have the new man in you. But you still right. have the old man in you as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, kind of similar to that. I think. Process of sanctification. Yeah, for sure. But there's, um, a, there's a grammatical thing going on here as yeah. well. Yeah. Which is that this way of talking, which is kind of, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, maybe this is too grammatical. This is, <laughs> you know, kind of third person singular present tense. Yeah. It, he is, she is, is, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is a way of saying, um 
you know, kind of this is how things are here. Yeah. Uh, but but kind of meaning this is how they should be. So so there's another example of that. Um, words of Jesus himself in Mark 10. Let me see if I can get the reference where I think it's James and John have been sort of wanting to be great, haven't they? Yeah. Asking to sit at his right yeah. hand. Yeah. And Jesus talks about the attitude of, of leaders amongst the Gentiles. Do you know the bit I'm talking about? I I know the reference. Yeah. So this is um, Mark 10, verses 35 to 45. And um, in particular, in Mark 10, verse 43, Jesus says, well, it isn't like this among you. You know, you, in other words, you, you shouldn't be mm. seeking to to um, get one up <laughs> over yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Um, to be superior to each other in that way. But of course, actually, at that point of time, it is like that among them, because that's exactly what they're uh, doing. Uh, okay, so that, that, that's helpful. That, yeah, that that use of it is yep. doesn't always mean I'm describing how it is. It can be an exhorting thing. Gotcha. Yeah. And okay. that that gotcha. is what is going on. In... Gotcha. Okay. That's really helpful for, yeah, for this, for the warning. I mean, again, not, not, not saying it's a warning passage, but what people generally think is a warning passage. Okay. How can I possibly be united to Christ, uh, one with the son, as the son is with the father, if I'm still sinning? And First John 3 says, if you are in the son, then you don't sin. So I think they, they have a hard time when they see First John 5 and they say, um, he who says he has no sin is a liar. So they're trying to like make all this stuff work and like, how do I view this? And I think that's, that's an extremely helpful way of not like trying to fit these things, but like saying, okay, what is John trying to do in this passage in relationship with everything else that he's written as well to, to those who are in the sun? Yeah. Yeah. And that it's, it's going back to assurance too, because it's just as if his justification, just as if you already are, it's, 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 um, it's going to happen that you're going to, if you're justified, you are for sure going to go to heaven and be glorified. And in that state, we'll be in perfect state and we won't be seeing in Christ. We'll see each other for who we are. That's as God sees Christ. He sees us too. And, uh, and even though we're on this side of heaven in life, we still sin, but we're going, we've already been justified and we haven't crossed the finish line yet. And we still sin right now, but, we for sure will be glorified. Yeah. So, um, so we'll, oh, move on to the next question. Uh, you've got a, a fascinating chapter on covenant and eschatology in John, as it bears in our union with Christ. Our assumption is uh, most listening and those who will read your book don't generally associate eschatology to union, um, but you do. So maybe you could help us explain what. Uh, eschatology that term too is in this context can you guide our listeners to this intersection uh in theology okay so eschatology is uh the study of the last things um you might say therefore it, it's the study of the life of the age to come mm -hmm. but what what you see in in John's gospel, and I think all the way through the New Testament actually, is that 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 life of the age to come is is already breaking in, yep, and already happening, right? Yep. So you, you might say that's kingdom life, yeah. Yep, totally. Yep. And one of the things that's really sort of fascinating, um, to me at least, that came out of this work. Yeah. Is 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 that John um, talks about the life of the age to come as being sort of equivalent to this oneness with Christ? Hmm. Yes. Yeah? So so the 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 aspect of the life of the age to come that he continually sort of foregrounds mm -hmm. is our union with Christ, and it's as if he's saying. Do you want to know what heaven is going to be all about? Do you want to know what true life is all about? Well, it, it's about this kind of 
knowing of Jesus. It's about this kind of in one another relationship with him. Um, it, it's about this kind of oneness with him. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that's important pastorally. Yeah, totally. So that that I mean, you, you, you see it there right on the surface of, uh, of the text in the gospel in John 17, verse three. Do you want do you want to read that to us? John 17, verse three, maybe. Yeah, I'll get that up right now. So we have John 17, three, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Right. So, you know, there's this 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 equation there of eternal life. That is the life of the age to come um, and 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 knowing God mm -hmm. and knowing Christ. And, and that knowing is that that in one another knowing that in one another relationship. And OK, so you see that verse and you think, well, OK, he might be saying they're the same thing. Um, and, and then when you go and dig deeper, it turns out he, he keeps on saying, actually, mm -hmm. they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. I, for, for, for example, you see that really clearly in John 6. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really striking. That is really striking. Yeah, yeah. So you just talked about the kind of the pastoral, um, you can say kind of Christian life implications of this. We, we've been kind of touching on this topic as well. And and you make the yeah. point throughout your book, and it's not just union. And, and like I said, it's not just kind of us grafted onto the side of, of uh of oneness and and we just kind of ride along and, and nothing really happens with us but it actually helps ground our christian walk it helps ground um who we are in, in our everyday life not just on sundays but sunday yeah. through sunday it it it, walk, it it goes through everything but how does how does this help us knowing that we're not just kind of grafting on the side which we, we sometimes think um but we're inserted into all the joys and the benefits of this relationship between the triune Godhead. I, I've re written another book actually, <laughs> which is called one being united to Jesus changes everything. And that's coming out with union publishing in September. And it explores, you know, what are the sort of practical implications of this? And, you know, I think it's got it's got implications for all all the different areas of the Christian life. So yeah. what what does it mean to pray? Uh, what what does it mean to worship? Um, how does it change what our take might be on obedience? Mm -hmm. um, what what is heaven going to be like and what is it that you're looking forward to? And. I suppose just to summarize the sort of common thread through all of that is that mm -hmm. I, I kind of have this conviction that certainly here in the UK, and I don't know, maybe in the US as well, you can tell me mm -hmm. that there's maybe an emphasis to, sorry, there's maybe a, a habit of de-emphasizing the, the deeply relational aspect of the Christian life, you know, communion with God, um there's a habit of of really kind of focusing on what we've been saved from yeah and and not what we've been saved for and saved into and actually mm. what god wants us to enjoy um and and delight in as as he delights in us so 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 what does it change for me i think it changes what it's like to sit down um, you know, kind of early in the morning on a Wednesday morning and pray because it, it changes my view of, of what God is like. You know, it, it sort of helps me to, to remember that he is Trinity and that he is love. Yeah. Um, but also that, that, you know, he kind of pours out that same love on me in the vine, if you like. And, and what he's wanting from me is not something transactional. You know, he he he's wanting something deeply relational from me. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you when you when that really, you know, when we let that really sink in, that that is profound. 
you know, God, God wants me to relate to him as my father. Kind of yeah. learning to do it in the same sort of way that Jesus did that when he was here on earth. Yeah. And, and he actually wants that. You know, yeah. he, he kind of invites me to to commune with him in that way. And and that's what prayer should be about. That's what sung worship should be about. Yeah. yeah. That that's that's great to bring up because when the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? He says, pray this way, our father. He didn't say uh he said he addresses like he said, he's the your Lord father God, too. This is what we want. I, this is what we want. He's your father, father too. He's your father right. too. And that's how Christ prays, our father. So yeah, because if I had to guess again this is very broadly painted brush but maybe even american evangelicalism they'll talk about what we're saved from but it's less so our sin or the father's condemnation over us because of our sin it's more so like kind of not the greatest life it's um uh, things aren't going well and relationships are broken and your life is kind of broken less so in relationship with god but more so kind of interrelationally um, and we're saved towards, and it's a little bit more on the, um, when you're talking about the relational stuff, the horizontal. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, horizontal, it's horizontal. I think it's, it's based horizontal, but I think it's inverted vertically. So it's a little bit more, um, church tends to have the emphasis on like, Hey, here's the steps you can take to increase your relationship with, with God less. Mm -hmm. So here's what God has done to right. have a relationship with you. It, right. I think, I think I, in general, I think American evangelicalism flips that. Um, okay. right. And I think this union is really helpful for Christians. Yeah. That helps that. yeah it, it's not, it's not, um, okay, here's, here's seven steps to a better prayer life. So you can commune with God better. So you actually, you, you have that communion with God. He's, he's right. opened that with you and you, right. you get to experience that. It's not, it's not on you to open that communion. Right. Absolutely. I think yeah. I think it's very helpful for that. I got a quick uh, two-parter uh, last question. It's super simple, I promise. Um, okay. It's like, uh, so before people read your book, would you say a good prerequisite would we obviously open up the Bible and read the Gospel <laughs> of John, first, second, and third John? Would you say that that would be just a fantastic prerequisite before you grab your book, get familiar with the Gospel of John, go through first, second, one, two, and three. Reading Greek a couple times through and <laughs> diagram all the sentences. No, just, just, I, yeah. I mean, if someone were really pushed for time, you know, read um, John 6 and John 13 to 17 and one John. Okay. Uh, again, maybe, or even maybe for the first time. I don't right. Know. And, and my second part of that is, uh, basic question by know some lay people and maybe even non-Christians would be asking this is they, we know that, uh, John wrote revelation. How come revelation isn't included into this? Right. Um, there's an appendix in the book mm -hmm. on revelation. Okay. Um, you, you don't get any of that. You and me, me and you language in revelation. It's just, yeah. it's just there. Okay. Um, so that is why I don't, talk about revelation a lot in uh, the the book of revelation that is a lot uh -huh, uh, yeah <laughs> in, in the nspt volume but there is there's quite a lot on participation with with christ in revelation um sharing in his sonship uh, sharing in his victory um sharing in his mission as the people who follow him um, are also faithful witnesses. So there's 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 lots of yeah lots of participation, which we've said is is, is that sharing. Mm, okay. Cool. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, Doctor Bowser, is there any parting words or on your end, like John does, an exhortation for our for our <laughs> audience uh, to either read this book or to, to learn from this, and just some some the uh, the Doctor Bowser last words. Oh. Um, yeah, please do read it. Um, it was a lot of fun to do this work. And yeah, maybe just to say, I, th I think working on this changed me a lot. It changed my devotional life. Hmm. And it made me realize how, how astonishing the, the sort of 
intimacy is that 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 God desires with us um mm. and, and and that we can know in in worship in prayer um and that you know when when we go to glory that is going to be you know blown up even bigger yeah. um yeah. so yeah it's an amazing awesome. hope and and sort of to to get ready for that by by entering into this now and and going deeper into that fellowship that's yeah. great well dr Bowser, thank you so much for writing this for your work um for the book that's coming out pretty soon so i'd encourage people yeah. to buy this one as it comes out because i think it's already come out in the uk and it comes yeah. out in the u.s the week we publish this so people by the time this is published you can buy the book um, it's been a pleasure having you on to talk about oneness with christ participation with christ the gospel of john Pistols of John. It's, this has been a pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure for me too. Thanks so much for the invite. Of course. Okay.